this vision of human possibility and human help has not been lost in the traditions. It's there in both the great medical traditions of the East and the West. This is the caduceus with the two snakes. And the story is that these two snakes were quarreling on the ground, the snakes of the inner way and the outer way. And that the Greek god Hermes placed the staff in between them and they twined themselves forever around this staff in union very occasionally and in opposition most of the time. The unions are very difficult because the inner and the outer way is almost impossible to hold simultaneously in the same mind. If you're in meditation and you reach a place of clarity and stability and peacefulness and uh, non-cognitiveness, the world is not there in the way we normally experience it. You can't have both at the same time. If you're in the outer world, you lose the awareness of the innerness. It's just the nature of how that works. It's only the enlightened being, in fact, that can hold both simultaneously at the same time. And the dove figures really symbolize dove wings, the enlightened, aware, awakened human being who can seamlessly interweave the outer and the inner aspects of healing into a whole that leads to the end of all suffering and the promotion of human flourishing. If you look to the east, you see precisely the same uh, image. This is the medicine Buddha, with the blue of immeasurable compassion as his color. He holds in his right hand the aurora plant, which is the symbol of all external remedies and therapies. He holds in his left hand a bowl, which traditionally is a skull cap, which signifies the uh, overcoming of death, immortality, and is filled with the elixir of wisdom. The inner and the outer way, again. And the figure, the transcendent enlightened figure, who has the wisdom and the awareness to seamlessly interweave these two aspects of the human experience, these two aspects of healing, in a way that allows for the end of all suffering and the promotion of humans, human flourishing. So we really find that in the great sages, in the great traditions of healing, East and West, the vision, the understanding, of course, truth doesn't come in many varieties, is the same, precisely the same, no difference at all. And what we find is that it is possible to bring suffering, all suffering, to an end. Now, when you only work with the outer way, you can perhaps bring some temporary relief to physical suffering. Not much. Some to disease, some to aging, some to death, but not much. You potentially can deal with some of the gross aspects, psychologically, of the emotional afflictions. Desire, aversion, hatred, greed, jealousy, pride, ignorance. But you cannot get to the root sources of those, psychologically. You cannot. It's too gross a system. And therefore, it's like weeding a garden. They just come up again. And perhaps we learn how to manage those things a little bit better. Or to diminish their intensity, or their capacity to disturb us. But that is the limit of, to which we can end suffering with our outer medicines, alternative and conventional, and with our psychologies and mind-body medicine at the level at which we use them. We can't go any further. We cannot relieve the real sufferings of the physicality of life, that is the suffering of disease, aging, and death. We cannot relieve the subtle sufferings and the persistent sufferings of emotional afflictions through our psychologies. We cannot begin to touch the existential sufferings of aloneness, of the fear of death, the fear of freedom, separateness, etc., the plague of soul, the securities, insecurities, anxiety, and depressions as part of both of those aspects of emotional and existential sufferings. And we can't even touch the conditioning underneath, which is what gives forth to all of that, which is the belief in a solid and existent I, 
and our misperception of the nature of reality, because that is the fundamental cause of all suffering. So the outer ways that we have severely limit our ability to end suffering. And until we can come to an end of suffering, we cannot unveil and reveal what has always been there, which is the natural human condition of human flourishing, the wholeness, the peace, the joy, the love, the compassion, which just arise when suffering is brought to an end. We can't even come to that aspect of being can't even come to it. Our sense of what health is is so ordinary, so simple, and so limited in its ability to bring us to a rich, treasured life. So to do so, we have to bring together not the, uh, only the outer, but we must mature and develop the inner aspects of healing ourselves within us. This is not an informational process. It's a transformational process. And unless we commit ourselves to do that, as individuals, the rest of what we achieve by gathering information is merely entertainment and abstraction that we will take to the last day of our death without having had an experience to live the full fortune and opportunities and the treasures of a life that can come to great flourishing. If you take those snakes and sort of turn them horizontally, what you will see is if you look historically, these inner and outer ways of healing, uh, these inner and outer ways of knowing, these two epistemologies, are almost always in opposition to each other. You have two periods we can speak of, the Hellenistic period and the Renaissance period, in which they have to some extent come together, and not necessarily within one person, but at least within cultures that can validate and affirm and acknowledge and value both the inner and the outer ways. What happens in between is there's a breakdown of this fragility of holding both, and we go into the dominance of one. It could be in the spiritual aspect of the Christian period when science and outer ways of knowing the world disappear. It could be in modernity when the scientific um, model takes over and inner ways of knowing disappear completely. We're now at a point where we're crossing again, and we can either bring these two back together and hold them, which is an incredible human task that's required of all of us individually in terms of our own work, or we can go the way again of simply having one dominate the other. Remember what Jung always said, is if you have one aspect of knowing too powerful, too dominant, the other one will constellate itself from the unconscious and begin to rise. And that's what's happening in our time. The problem is, will that take over and again allow this same endless cycle of the other? The enormous shift is it actually a reversal of consciousness. You shift from finite to infinite, from duality to non-duality, from I, from self, from personality, to non-I, non-self, non-personality. There is an enormous shift it is not a minor thing to make this shift. So you must know that. It's a complete reversal. It doesn't happen automatically. It's not easy. It's a heck of a lot of work. But when you do that, your relationships begin to change from codependent to partnership to psychological to spiritual. Your worldview begins to change from I to other to all of us to all to one. You begin to change medical institutions as an example from the medical industrial complex to centers for integrative healing, the centers of human flourishing. And the body changes because they begin to develop the capacity at subtle levels of consciousness to use the plasticity of the mind and the body, of the physiology of our, uh, of our brain and of our body system consciously and intentionally because we have developed the level of consciousness that can do that. Our efforts now at mind-body interventions are so crude because of the level of our consciousness. What yogis can do, and somebody spoke about Tumo the other day, there are many examples. When you reach those high levels of consciousness, then you're talking about that body becoming completely plastic. So this is the scope, basically. The expansion of consciousness drives a larger medicine. With that comes the worldview change from I to other, 
to us, to all of us, to all, to non-duality. With that comes the change in the character of our interrelatedness, from codependence to psychological to spiritual. Within that comes the change in how we deal with our environment, the quality of governance that we have, the cultural institutions and what they provide us with. Bhutan now has a project called the Gross National Happiness Project, GNH project, in which they measure the accomplishments of their society, not by economic development, by the level of the happiness. That comes when you have that level of consciousness in a society. And then the body begins to change because the intentionality can create neurogenesis, can affect the immune system, on and on. So this is a cyclical, self-perpetuating process. All of it dependent on the inner development. Without that, we stay where we are. So we begin with an expansion of consciousness. We then bring that into our personal and professional lives. And with that, we expand it into our cultural value systems, our institutions. And then we begin to change uh, uh, the body itself. And this is the kind of medicine we need to move towards. If we do that, we move from a survival medicine to one of human flourishing. We now can get about halfway up there, and that's it. That's what we call health. It's ordinary health, ordinary life, it's normal. If we want human flourishing, we can only get it, and the end of all suffering, through a much decent, deeper piece of work inside. So this is all prelude to what that piece of work is. This is Jung's work about the, that he did when he studied alchemy. This is the developmental process he speaks of. You start with the primal unity of the child, which is the simplicity and the unity and the non-duality that exists in wisdom. You can't do much about it. The romanticists wanted to go back to it, but none of us will go back to it. What can you do with it? It's wonderful, but it has no wisdom with it. So the necessary wounds take place, and there is the psychological life we develop. And we develop all kinds of tools to work with the gross afflictions of our psychological life, desire, greed, aversion, right, desire, greed, aversion, pride, jealousy, anxiety, depression, the rest of it. We work with that as best we can, but we do it grossly because we don't have the tools to get to the root. Once we begin to work with that, we can move in to developing the spiritual life, which is a whole different process and a whole different methodology. Remember T.S. Eliot said, we shall never cease our exploration. And then we, sh we shall in the end arrive from where we started from, the same unity, the same oneness, but know it for the first time. That's our humanness. We can know that spiritual development. Now, we can get glimpses. We all get them, you see, but they don't mean a heck of a lot. We can get glimpses of that space of non-duality. This is a mandala. We get a, we get a glimpse of the center of the mandala, but we don't know anything about the complexity. So that glimpse drops down to a normal ego state. We can't do anything with it. It's just a glimpse. It's a temptation. So anybody can have a spiritual experience. We see it in relationships. Sexuality, orgasm is the is uh, the, the orgasmic state and the sexual experience not as a, as a lustful experience is in fact the place of enlightenment in Buddhism. Not about the sexuality because it produces the place of timelessness, spacelessness, non-I-ness, non-duality. We all miss it. <laughs> we miss it because we take the pleasure. But that glimpse is the essence. And the mandala. You know, the still point of the turning world, neither, neither from nor towards it, the still point, there the dance is. And there's only the dance. T.S. Eliot's words again. So we get these great glimpses in nature, many, many other things, places. I feel a sense sublime of something more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is in the light of setting suns, the great ocean, the blue sky, and in the mind of men is spirit and emotion that compels all thoughts and all objects of all thoughts and rolls over everything. Beautiful, beautiful sense of it. We can't hold it. Unless you've done the spiritual development, it'll take you to a place that can hold these experiences. They just drop down into an egotistical state 
of being and they get lost, or if anything, they, they create an egomania. So we need to look at the systematic forms of getting there, and there are many methodologies that are well proven and well documented by which we can get to that place. Some of that I will talk about in the workshop this afternoon. The Socratic system is there. You can find it in Plato's Republic, in the parable of the cave or the simile of the line. But it's not well developed. It's not what was happening at the East simultaneously, unfortunately. The alchemists also had their system of seeking the gold, which is psychological and spiritual, not physical. But it was not well developed. You have a better development in the yoga system, or the Patanjali system, of the movement from ethical discipline to concentration to meditation. You have probably the best development in the Buddhist system, and these are the six perfections of the sutra path. I'm not going to go into them here. But there are many systematic processes which are lifelong, or multiple lifelong processes. They all are basically Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. Remember, he said the hero's journey of today is not the same as it was in the day of Galileo. Where there was once light, there is now darkness. Where there was once darkness, there is now light. It's the hero's deed today to once again bring light to the coordinated soul of the lost Atlantis. The development of the inner life is our journey through one of the many methodologies of the hero's journey. And it all begins by cultivating a ground. You cannot develop an innerness unless you begin to create the soil for that innerness. There has to be some turning away from worldliness. There has to be some time for solitude, contemplation, and reflection. There has to be even the artificial development of loving kindness, if that's all that we can do. There has to be the subscription to ethical discipline until it becomes a natural part of the unfolding of wholeness. That means no lying. No dishonesty, no harmfulness, no divisive speech, no trivial speech, etc. If we don't use those, our minds will never be quiet enough to begin even the process of meditation. So there is a cultivation of the ground that doesn't come until there's enough suffering and enough age to know I want more. Or to look in the face of a Dalai Lama, to look in the face of a Gandhi, to look in the face of a great one and say, I want to be that. I want to be that. Because that's all that's going to matter at the end. That's the only meaningful life I could have. And when you see it, your face begins to turn in another direction. And unless that turn place, turning takes place, nothing can change. There must be a soil for inner development. There must be time for it, a commitment for it, a value for it a taste of it, a sense that this is what my life is about. I want to die on my deathbed and be able to say my life was meaningful. It was not lived of the fictions of my mind and my constructed mental experience. That it really was a place of beingness and knowingness because the inner dimensions give you access to a cognitive pristineness, an unconditioned knowing of the world. That has nothing to do with anything on our brain. You can just begin to see directly the truth of the unity of all things. There is no question. It comes with an absolute and total certainty that I and you are not separated by six dimensions, five dimensions, or any dimensions. That what's outside is not outside. It's the representation inside. And inside interpenetrates with outside. Outside interpenetrates with inside, there's no separate, you begin to see the reality of it all. And how could you but not have compassion for the suffering that goes on with the delusions of the, this, this fictitious, constructed mind and worldview that we live with, where there are endless stories that if you try to touch those stories, feel them, find their color, their shape, their form, you can't, they disappear, they don't exist. So to have a meaningful life, you have to begin with certain preparations Meditation is the investigative tool. It is not a tool of relaxation. It's a way of looking at the mind to understand how it works, to tame it, to train it, to transform it, so it gives you the truth of life and opens up the treasures that we spoke about. It's a very subtle process of meditation. 
It is systematically taught in the, in the East. You don't see it that way at all in the West. We'll talk about it in my workshop a bit this afternoon. There are two basic phases of it in the tradition. One is the achievement of a calm mind, and the second is what you see in that unconditioned calm mind, and that is the truth of life itself. <clears throat> Just to tell you again that systematically there are different levels of inner development. The witnessing mind is probably the transitional one, but there's a moving mind and a quiet one, and you're working with both of them. They're actually both the same. With calm abiding, you have brought your mind to a perfect place of ease. No work, no mindfulness, no attention, no concentration, thoughts, feelings come up, they go down. You don't identify, you don't attach with them. You are in a place of complete ease, total clarity, and total stability. And when you are there, you can begin to see with a naked awareness the way things really are. And it's from that mind that you can understand what health is about. You cannot understand it from an ordinary consciousness. You cannot understand homeless peace, love, and joy. As we speak of it, human flourishing from an ordinary consciousness. You can only know it directly. These are states that you can identify. There are markers, there are signs, there are ways to achieve them, they're incremental. There's a different medicine and health that's achievable with each one of them. And when you go to the end, you develop many, many, many eyes, as Alex Gray was so talented to portray. And you begin to see all the aspects of the human experience simultaneously. The outside manifestation, the subtle energies, and the consciousness of naked awareness from which all evolves. And it's all one, and it's all the same. And it's in that light that we can flourish our humanity into the richest health that we could possibly have. And then health becomes a holy and sacred act, not a medicinal experience. Just to put a little light on this, a fellow named Davidson is, is, is uh, at the William Keck Laboratories in Wisconsin studying Tibetan meditators for the first time. Can't find much information on it yet. There's some in Goldman's book called Destructive Emotions. What he is finding has to do with the left prefrontal cortex, which is where positive emotions are compared to the right uh, prefrontal area where the disposition is for glass half full. And take a group of people and put them through an eight-week eight period of John Kabat-Zinn's mindfulness training, which is a very uh, gross level of med meditative training. And you can see change in immune function. There were both groups who were vaccinated, those who waited for the training and didn't uh, for the flu. You can see a difference in the immune function, you can see a difference in prefrontal activity moving to the left, and you can see um, emotional changes taken on serve waste. So even in the very beginning of this process of commitment to inner development, in the very beginning we begin to change the level of health that's possible. Now when you put Tibet, Tibetan meditators into this system, you saw enormous changes which are inconceivable to ordinary health in terms of states of well-being, in terms of the flow MRIs and the EKG recordings that he has done, the ECG recordings of these Tibetan meditators. So from the very beginning we can see it, and that's encouraging to us. We don't have to look to the mountaintops. We need to look to the beginning of that process. So that is the movement from scientific to integral medicine. What happens practically is in uh, our conventional medicine, alternative and conventional, conventional the um, individual is an object, the practitioner is ex extracting information from that, uh, 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 from that individual. Depending upon his particular system, he comes to a diagnosis, he takes that diagnosis, and then he then uh, prescribes the remedies in relationship to that system. If you work at a higher level, you are sitting with that patient in a place of naked awareness. You're listening to the story, which is the psychology, your constructed story, you're listening through that story to their essence, and you are finding out with that person the truth of their life and the way in which you must approach it in order to deal with bringing suffering to an end temporarily and completely and beginning to institute human flourishing as a possibility. Different people, dispositions, different ways to start. You listen, many ways we learn to listen. If you listen through a system, you're going to hear the answers to that system and nothing more. 
Be air, listen to your own psychology interpreting this person, you're going to get your own autobiography. If you listen to naked awareness, without any conditioning, you will hear who is there at all levels, and you will know what has to be done. You will know, because you'll hear. Doesn't mean you don't spend time asking questions related to the approach, but you must first meet that person from that place. So the diagnosis will be at all levels, and even more, because the things you're going to feel and experience that go beyond those things. And the prescription will be outer, will be inner, will be individually detailed. It'll be open-ended because it will change continuously over time. It will be temporary relief of suffering and the effort towards a permanent relief of all suffering and the establishment of human flourishing. And I don't know how many of you know the image of the thousand arm Avalokitesvara, the Buddha of compassion. All of his thousand hands in that tanka have a Buddha eye in it. He has a thousand ways to reach out to help because everybody's got their own way of needing help. And sometimes it's a fierce face, sometimes a gentle face, sometimes it's Dharma, and sometimes it's a medicine. But you've got to have the wisdom in each one of those hands to know what it is that person needs at this moment, at this time, and it's not because you have this system that they need that in your system. They need what they need. And you need a thousand arms and a thousand Buddha eyes to see. And the only way you get that is to do the inner development. And that's the kind of prescription that we would all would like. And it's even more, because when we sit in naked awareness with a person, there is a presence we give them. Most people don't have five minutes of presence in their entire life of another person. And that presence alone is enormously healing. And the acknowledgement that comes of their humanity the compassion, the holding, the livingness, the, the dynamic openness and richness of that experience is there. And that's the part of the prescription also. And that's just what happens between two humans engaged in the process of divine life. And so to, to bring it to an end, driven by an expansion of consciousness, we transcend and embrace scientific medicine, alternative therapies, and integrative medicine as we now know it. We engage all aspects of healing, we seek to alleviate all causes of suffering, and we promote human flourishing and optimal well-being. Come on up there. Not through. <laughs> Purpose is to bring an end to all suffering and to bring us these treasures that are sitting right underneath our feet right now, for God's, God's sakes, to see them. They tell the story of a fisherman who goes down to the sea every dawn, and one day it's dark, he picks up a bag, and he starts throwing the rocks into the water, you know? And then a light comes up, and he sees he's got one rock left. One rock left. It's a diamond. He threw all of his diamonds away. Most of us, he had one left. Most of us have none. You see, we're talking about something large. Large change. This is Corona's boy done in 600 BC in ancient Greece. Look at it. Look at a funeral steel done 150 years later. That's change. That's a change in consciousness. Look at the Madonna and Child done in the 13th century. Look at a Madonna and Child done 150 years later. Look at the change. That's what we're talking about. Do we have the courage to do it? Do we have the motivation to do it? Is our time now? Can we sustain that tradition to bring it to life again? Petal by petal, realization by realization, we can flower into that great lotusness of our being. And I'm going to read Ken Wilber's words. And he says, at the end, we will find, I believe, the inherent joy in existence itself. A joy that stems from the great perfection of this in every moment. A wondrous whole in itself. A part of the whole of the next. A sliding series of holes and parts that cascade to infinity and back, never lacking, never wanting, because always filled in the brilliance that is now. Spirit that is much too obvious to see and much too close to reach. 
and the integral search finally succeeds by letting go of the very search itself. And there it dissolves into a radical freedom and consummate fullness that was always already the case. So that one abandons the theory of everything in order to simply be everything. One with the all in this endless awareness that holds the cosmos kindly in its hand. And then the true mystery yields itself, the face of spirit secretly smiles. The sun rises in your very own heart. The earth becomes your very own body. Galaxies rush through your veins while the stars light up the neurons of your light, night. And never again will you search for a mere theory or a mere method, which is actually your own original face. And I want to finish that T.S. Eliot poem for you. With the love of the calling and the voice of the calling, we shall never cease our exploration. And the end of all our exploring, we shall return to the place from which we started, but know it for the first time. Through the unknown but remembered gate. These are T.S. Eliot's last words in poetry, by the way. Through the unknown but remembered gate, that place back to our wholeness, when the last piece of earth yet to be discovered is that which, which was at the beginning, at the source of the greatest river, is the silence of a hidden waterfall. And look, the children playing in the apple tree, not seen because not looked for, heard only, only half heard in the stillness between two waves of the sea. A place of complete simplicity, cost purchased at the cost of everything that we believe in, that we take on, that we call I, Purchase at the cost of everything, all things will be well, all manner of things are well. Tongues of flame will be enfolded into a knotted crown of fire. And the fire and the rose will be one. The healer and the healing and the healy will be one. It will be done. It will be complete. Healing needs to be no further sought after. All healing will have come to an end. Complete. Done. Finished. Great poet Christopher Fry says, dark and cold these times may seem, but we are dark, not in a dark time now. The frozen misery of centuries begins to crack, break, thunder and flow. And the thunder is the thunder of the chains of the flows. Thank God our time is now when wrong comes up to meet us everywhere. Illusion comes up to meet us everywhere. Delusion comes up to meet us everywhere. Thank God our time is now. Thank God our time is now. We can take the longest stride of soul the man has ever taken the enterprises into the exploration of God, self, call it what you wish. It takes so many thousand years to wake. What are you making for with this triviality of conversation? of time, this endless accumulation of information, the wastage of these human years we have, we come together in a year from now, five of us won't be here. What are we making for an ordinary life, an ordinary health, we have all of this? It takes a thousand, thousand years to wake, but will you wake, for pity's sake?